Hey, Connexus Church, Pastor Mark Clark here. Really good to be with you again. We are doing a three-week series starting right now about the magic of Christmas. It's all out of Luke chapter one. So if you got a Bible, open it up to Luke chapter one. This amazing, crazy story happens, and it builds up toward, of course, your Christmas Eve service where Jesus gets born. And we're calling this series The Magic of Christmas. Uh, this is where Christmas starts. The first thing that happens, how it all begins, and there's this magical, weird moment. And it, that word magic, why use that word? Well, it doesn't mean in like the real world, dark arts kind of magic. Actually, God is against that, and that's part of our journey. It's to actually find the real magic in that sense, that the good side that fills the world, that magic, the one who fills the world with his presence, his love, his grace, his peace for all of us, and it's something we're all pining for. And what does it look like to reach into that world and grab a hold of it? That's why we sit down and watch the Hallmark movies. That's why we watch Beauty and the Beast. That's why we watch romance comedies and these, these great epic stories that we, it's, it's magic at the center of our existence. And what we begin to realize, man, is that some of why those stories are so important and why we come back to them is because Christianity comes along and says, Jesus actually comes and fulfills those stories. He makes those stories, everything that they, those myths were pointing toward. Jesus is the prince that comes down for his bride, who leaves his palace and has to defeat a dark enemy, Satan, sin, and death to win her back. It's all these stories with their magic, but that they're somehow real. Right, it's like we as humankind have like memory of a time when, like Peter Pan, we could like fly, and we're going back to the world somehow. Uh, what does that even look like? Where things are really enchanted in a sense. The Victorian poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning once said, "Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush is a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest." They sit around and they pluck blackberries. See, what if we could, from, from the, this day onward, be the first kinds of people? Like, admittedly, we're just surrounded by the second kind of people at almost every moment, right? Every sphere of our lives, there are people and places and things just fighting for us to just do nothing. Sit around, pluck blackberries, don't ask the massive questions, see the physical and temporal world around us with all of its decadence and flavor and sparkle and ease and quick hits of pleasure and they ask us to just settle. Just settle for that, that's good enough. And yet this whole season, this Christmas season and where it came from, it's magical in that sense. It's it's weird. It's supernatural. It asks us to have every bush aflame with God rather than settling. It's supernatural at its core. There's virgin births. And if you're a skeptic and you're with us at Connexus, awesome. So glad that you're here because we're going to be exploring this stuff. Virgin births, angels, visitors from heaven, confused teenagers, the whole thing, let's admit it, is bizarre. And that's the awesome thing about it. So hopefully for all of us, that God would use, and we're gonna talk about this today, imperfect people and imperfect circumstances. D do you feel that in this season of planet Earth right now, this imperfect time right now? And yet, if we, if we maybe look at it for a second and we're open to, to what God could do, maybe he could do something magical in your life, in all of us. So how does the story start? It starts in verse uh, 26, uh, Luke chapter one, it says, it's it, it, gonna talk about an angel showing up. And it says, in the sixth month. So, so, so that's the sixth month since Elizabeth has been pregnant. That's what the text is talking about. So if you got your Bibles, make sure you're in it. Luke chapter one, verse 26. So who is Elizabeth? She's, uh, Mary, of course, is Jesus' mom. Most of us know that, even if you're here and you're new. Elizabeth is Mary's sister, so it's Jesus' aunt. So the whole story of Christmas starts with her. And an angel, literally a messenger named Gabriel, shows up and the text calls him Gabriel. And there's only two angels that are ever named in the Bible, Gabriel and Michael. I don't know if you knew that. Only two. And this is the high-end angel, like a leader of angels. And the text says that he was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So th this is a really upside down, almost oxymoronic idea that an angel of this caliber would be sent to a city in a place like Nazareth because, and this is what we don't get as modern readers, 
Nazareth was a hole in the wall, guys. It was the kind of dead end town. It had graffiti all over the place. It was run by the mob. You know, it's a place you don't want to go to. It, like, like it was only 50 to 100 people tops at the time. It was the place you stop when you're going somewhere. It's the place you go and get gas from. You go to the 7-Eleven, you get a corn dog, and you get out of there. That's Nazareth. It's the place on the way to the actual place. And it really, and you, and you got to hear this with your own like, life. It's, it's a place God should not visit and he should not use. It's a disaster. It's messed up like us who come in here with our, with our sin, with our secrets, with our narcissism, with, with the sexual stuff maybe you've done. The, the, the stuff you've done with money, the stuff maybe you've done against other people, the things you've done to your own family, the, the things you've done to your friends behind their back, whatever it is, the things that we're the kind of people God should not use. We are the Nazareth of the world. That's where you're supposed to see yourself in the story. You're not the angel. You're not Mary. You're not Jesus. We're the holes in the wall. And yet an angel is sent and does this amazing thing in that very place. Actually, this place is very similar to Bethlehem, where Jesus ends up getting born. Bethlehem is that kind of place too. I've, I've actually been there, I went there years ago. It's the kind of place God doesn't get born in. And so here's, if you're gonna be God and you wanna influence the world, you should have come to Jerusalem or Rome or Athens right, some cultural hub. Today, if God arrived today, he'd go to LA or Paris or London or New York. He's not gonna go, hey, I'm gonna go up to, you know, whatever. It's like a place with no power, a place with no influence, Barry, all right, Aurelia, like what are we talking about? He's gotta show up to the places and yet God does this amazing thing. So so some of you are like, yeah, you, you don't know what I've done, Mark. I know you're sitting here and I'm with all these church people and I'm, maybe I'm watching this online or I'm in the room right now you don't know what I've done with my family. You don't know what I've done with my finances. You don't know the mistakes I've made. You have no idea what kind of stuff I walk in here with. That's true. But as I've shared from my own story over and over and over again, guys, I'm the poster boy for God should never have used me in any significant way at all in my life. I come from a broken home. My father was a deadbeat dad, alcoholic, divorced my mom, couldn't keep a job. His sister was a schizophrenic who killed herself. I got a million stories, guys, about why I shouldn't be sitting on this screen right now teaching you the Bible and pastoring a church. I had this uh, girl tell me recently that she was at a church in Seattle and uh, she was sitting there in the back and there was the, 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 the worship was going and she looked over and she saw this homeless guy sitting in the back row and he was kind of twitching around and she was like, I don't know what this is wrong with this guy. And so she's like, I'm gonna wait till the next worship song's over and then I'm gonna go over and encourage him. But then that was the end of the worship set. And the pastor got up and, and said, hey, I want to welcome our guest speaker today. And, and the homeless guy walks up the aisle, walks up on stage, and he's the guest speaker. And guys, it was me, all right? It was Mark Clark. I was the twitching homeless dude. Like, this is what I'm talking about. I got Tourette's syndrome. I got obsessive compulsive. I got a million reasons why God should never use me in the world. But why does he do it? Because God loves taking the broken things, the ridiculous things of the world and does something with them, just like he can do with you. This is what Christmas is all about. God writes straight with crooked lines, an old writer said. He enters in to your brokenness, your hurt, your pain, and he uses you not because of you, but in spite of you. This is what, this is the beauty of the Christmas story. This is the magic of it. So you come in here and you're thinking, well, but I got to earn this. And I'm a, if I'm a good enough person, maybe God will accept me. And Christmas goes, this is what it's preaching at you. You're not, that's not you. You're broken. God comes to you in spite of how small and insignificant you are or how you feel. And that's the beautiful thing. I was got the privilege of going to preach uh, at Folsom Prison recently. I moved down to California six months ago uh, to greater Sacramento area, and Folsom Prison is like 20 minutes from my house. You know, the famous, you know, Johnny Cash, Folsom Prison Blues concert, all of that is literally 20 minutes from my house. So we as a church got to go in and do a day of hope. And I got to go in and hang out with all these inmates and preach, and, and I, pre I was like, Lord, what do you want me to share? And I, and I preached literally just verse by verse through the story of the prodigal son from Luke 15. And when I got up there, I shared with them, here's this progressive kid who fights against us. He made these reckless choices. And I looked at all these inmates who have been there, some of them 21 years. And, and, I, and they said, look, 
I said, uh, have, you know, how many of you can connect with this? A son who takes off, he doesn't care about God, he makes bad choices, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the minute he turns around and starts to walk back to his father, the father runs out and grabs him. And I said, how many of you had absent fathers? Raise your hand. And the whole, the whole room, like 200 guys put their hands up. And I said, how many of you had deadbeat fathers? How many of you had fathers who were alcoholics? How many of you had fathers who were drug addicts? Almost every hand went up. And listen, I said, here's what you get in Christianity, guys. You get a father who loves you. You get a good father. This is what Jesus does. He, you get the father who runs out and grabs you and has compassion on you. And these guys are sobbing. And, and uh, Pastor Ray the founder of the church I work at down here, he was with me and he got up to those guys and he said this great line. He says, you, you know, you may have done what they say you did, but you are not who they say you are. And some of you just need to hear that. You may have done the things that you did and maybe people even sitting around you don't even know about it yet, but you are not what those things say you are. You are more than those things. That's what the gospel says, but you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased if you believe the gospel. Now, and then it says this in verse 27. The angel came to a virgin, all right, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. Her name was Mary. So Mary's the virgin, obviously the mother of Jesus. For those of you who are all familiar, Joseph's her husband. So the story now switches from Elizabeth, her cousin, to Mary. It's like a movie scene. And this is Jesus' mom, and he calls her a virgin. So if you got your Bibles, underline that phrase, uh, uh, a virgin comes, comes to her, what does that mean? So, so here's the thing. There are actually many, I, I mean, you're probably sitting there going, well, what do you think it means? Well, it's not so easy because of course this is written in uh, Greek and then it's being translated also from Hebrew in the Old Testament. There are many scholars today and skeptics. So put yourself in the mind of the skeptic. I'll just speak to them for a quick second. People who don't believe in Christianity. And this is one of the reasons they say they don't. Because the word here, virgin, is the Greek word. It actually doesn't mean virgin. It simply means a young maiden or a young woman. Both in this text and in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where this is kind of quoting from, Isaiah says a virgin will be conceived or, and, and have a son, or a virgin will conceive and have a son and call his name Emmanuel. And so people, you know, Christians get up and they say, look, it says, and then people point out, they go, no, no, no. Both in the Greek and the Hebrew, it doesn't mean virgin the way we're using it. It means young maiden. And that's true, actually. But that doesn't say it isn't true. So let me explain. I remember a guy called me a few years ago, and he was a Jehovah's Witness. He called me up. He said, hey, pastor, it's, um, you work at that church, right? You teach the Bible. Yeah. And he's like, okay. So um, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I mean, he didn't come right out and say, like, I lead a cult or whatever. He was just like, hey, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I'm just working through things in my life. And I wanted to chat with you and because don't you believe some things about the Bible? And he said, don't you teach that this is a virgin? And I said, yes. And he goes, well, don't you know that word means young maiden? And actually, I surprised him and I said, yes, I actually know that. I agree with you. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, but that's not the reason I believe it. The reason I believe it isn't Isaiah and isn't Luke. It's actually Matthew. Because in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 1 and 2, it talks about the fact that Joseph never slept with Mary, and yet they had Jesus. And Mary had never slept with Joseph or any other man. Multiple times it actually says that. So the point of it is, is it's not about, oh, this word means this. We actually know from other texts of this is the reason we believe it. And of course, at that point, he just hung up. And I'm like, hello, hello, where are you going? Because, okay, I agree with you, it's not that, because we get it from other parts of the Bible, actually. So here's the point. It says he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. And that's, the whole point of this story is it's it's magic. It's truly a virgin birth. She was probably 15 years old. So in our culture, you know, 15 year old, you know, not married. She's not going to be married back then. If she gets pregnant, you know, it's out of wedlock. A, a Jewish girl when they were 15 back in that culture, it was very different, right? It didn't have the modern expression of dating that we had. You would have a caravan of chaperones around Mary and Joseph at all times. So Joseph wouldn't show up on his donkey at eight and go, all right, guys, I'm heading out now, going over to this dark spot, hanging out till 11. Like that didn't happen. That's why a lot of Jewish girls weren't getting pregnant when they're 15. That's what we do. And that's why we can't stay pure, 
right? I sit with young couples. I did young adult ministry for a long time, and they were like, man, I just, I'm trying, not, I'm trying to be faithful to Jesus and not sleep with my girlfriend. And it's like, okay, well, tell me about what you, you did recently. Well, we, you know, we snuggle up on the couch. It's about 11 o'clock, and we just put on a Jennifer Aniston movie, man, and things get handsy. It's like, well, of course things get handsy when you put on a Jennifer Aniston movie at 11, bro, and it's pitch black. You're not supposed to win that fight. That's the problem right there. You're supposed to put on the movie at 6 p.m., make it the stinking Grinch, and then get your family around and have a good time. That's the thing. And so that's what they did back then. It was more of a, hey, listen, we got people around me. So imagine you're 15 years old, teenage girls in the audience if you're there, or if you can remember what that's like being 15. Even Imagine you get visitation by an angel and they say, man, now you're going to be pregnant and you're going to raise God. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't even know how you do discipline when you're raising God. How do you discipline Jesus? You got to go take a timeout. I'll give you a timeout. <laughs> it's, it's like, how do you do that? It's like, don't talk to me, woman. Don't have to talk back to me. You stand before me in judgment one day, mom. Right? It's like, oh, yeah, I got to raise God. This is crazy. And so that's just going to be a weird dynamic. You're 15 years old. You're trying to raise God. This is crazy. So let me hone in on you for, for a minute here, women in particular. Can we just stop and say how awesome women are? <laughs> like, they're stronger. They're smarter, almost every psychological test that's done actually, than most men, um, they get accomplished what needs to get done, right? That's why every admin, every assistant I've ever had, they tried to give me guys. It was like, dude, I just asked you to do a basic task and the dude's like, oh shoot, I t right, I totally forgot about it. Can I have your job by the way? I'm like, what are you talking about? So women get stuff done. That's just what it is. And so here's... The, the, the angel doesn't come to Joseph and go, okay, here's the plan. Joseph would be like, sorry, what? I wasn't listening. It's what? The plan's what? That's just the difference between men and women. I remember going to um, church planting assessment years ago, and I answered, did all this preaching and vision, because I wanted to be a church planter, but I had to go and stand in front of a group that was going to affirm of whether I was good enough. At the end, they're like, okay, we're going to give you a green light. You can go plant a church. I'm like, perfect. So I did a good job, right? They're like, actually, no, your wife did. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? We're going to give you a pass. And this is a beautiful thing, women. They're just, they're just in many ways stronger, right? It was just the reality. I remember they would ask me questions. Hey, what's your neighbor's name? Because they wanted to make sure I was missional. I'd be like, I have no idea what my neighbor's name. And my wife would come up. She goes, well, there's Sarah. She's struggling with cancer. We brought, you know, cookies the other day to Margaret over there. I was like, what? This is what women do, and there's a reason, right? I can't, I can't picture God giving me the responsibility to birth children, to go through the pain of childbirth. I stub my toe, I'm out for a week, right? Women get sick, they just keep going. They just get up and they go, go, go. This is the beautiful thing. God uses a woman to get stuff done. Here's the other, here's the other angle on this. So thank you, women, you're awesome. The other angle on this is God interrupts, doesn't he? He doesn't, he doesn't ask Mary. He just does it and he overthrows her whole life. And some of you right now, you walked in here and listen to me, God is about to interrupt you. He's gonna save you. I mean, maybe in the service, maybe in three weeks from now, maybe two months from now, whatever it is, but maybe today, you'll never be the same because he's gonna interrupt you. He's gonna show you himself in a way that you never expected. And he's gonna go, I know you thought you were gonna go do this with your life but I'm actually moving you in this direction in your life now after today because you get confronted by the reality of Jesus, the reality of the gospel, and you go, gosh, I thought I was gonna, but now I got, this is what God does. He doesn't even ask Mary, hey, Mary, I just wanna come and pitch you an idea. I'm gonna put a baby in you. We're gonna chat about this. You're gonna raise him. He just does it, and he goes, by the way, this is already happening because sometimes God interrupts us. All right, and then look, down in verse, uh, down in verse 30, Here's what happens. It says, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Do not be afraid. Listen, every time an angel shows up in the Bible, you go look this up, they say that. Do not be afraid, which makes me go, what do angels look like? Like the fact that every time they show up, they go chill, everybody, do not be afraid. Like they might not look the way we like, what if they're all wacky? Like, they got eyeballs everywhere, and they got, they got like an eight-pack of, like, massive... Every single time, 
People and they go, oh my gosh, what's going on? Chill out, do not be afraid. Which is really good in our world and really good probably for your own life because the amount of fear and anxiety that's part of your life right now. We need to just hear this. Do not be afraid. Meaning God is in control of all things. I was, uh, I was down preaching at our um, Orange County campus this past weekend and a kid came up to me, probably 20 years old, athlete, and he just said, man, I heard you preach about this a few weeks ago, your obsessive compulsive disorder, where you hit certain things a certain amount of time so that certain things wouldn't happen in your life. And I have that. And I have to touch certain things and I have to do certain things. I have to, you know, what, what's, what do I do about it? And I said, honestly, the answer for me was it was solved when I got a theology of God's sovereignty, where I began to understand, because a friend unpacked for me, God is absolutely sovereign. Nothing happens without God sovereignly overseeing it, every sparrow, Sermon on the Mount, every sparrow that dies. And once you understand that you aren't in control of the universe, the anxiety starts to go. And so literally what he says is this, don't fear. Once you start to understand who God is, once you start to understand who God's grace and you have, and, and what, is, what is the grace of God? You have found favor with God. Once you start to understand you're not in control, the anxiety goes away in your life. And what is the grace of God? Undeserved favor. What we tend to think is, what if I could do my performance for God? Maybe one day he'll love me and accept me. There's only ways to read the Bible. It's either about him or it's about you. It's about what you can do for God or what God has done for you in the person and the work of Jesus. And some of us, we were raised in a church. Sometimes we read the Bible the first way and it's the wrong way. So you're reading the gospels. It's like, oh, there's all these Pharisees around. And they're like, hey, Jesus, we want to stone you and we want to hurt you and you're doing a bad job. And when you're reading those texts, you tend to be who in that story? Almost every time you do it, you're Jesus in those stories, right? You're like, you're the guy walking around just telling all your friends that are Pharisees that want to stone you. Hey, guys, I'm being a bad guy. This is the way to be holy. You guys are wrong. I'm Jesus. I'm just walking on water trying to help you guys out. Jesus gets, gets crucified. It's your friends not liking you. That's how you read the Bible. People in your small group are being a jerk to you. You know, listen, you're not supposed to read the story like that. You're supposed to be the Pharisee who is stoning Jesus. See, he dies for your sin, not, not their sin, yours. Because of you, for you, instead of you, and because of you. So, so you gotta understand that you're the bad guy in the story. You're the guys at the foot of the cross yelling because it's our sin that put him there. And he loves and saves us anyway. That's what grace is. So all this God coming down into a virgin in order to do this crazy thing. I don't, I don't know if you've stopped long enough this season, this kind of Christmas season to ask yourself this very important question, but it hit me recently. Why is it necessary that God did this? Like, like, why did God do it this way? Where, where he gave, where, where he came, where he interacted with a virgin and made it so that when Jesus lives his life and is conceived, it's gotta be done in this style with a virgin. There's a lot of answers that have been given throughout history. And I disagree with most of them. So let me tell you a couple answers that I disagree with, then I'll tell you what I think is going on. One of the answers that people give is that God does it this way because for Jesus to be sinless, he can't have two human parents. But I don't see that as true because that assumes that the father is the one that would have translated the sinful nature over to the child. And ladies, we love you, but I'm not sure we love you that much to say that you're sinless and you, you don't translate sin over to your kid. Right, I, maybe some lady smuggled that in somewhere in Christian history, right? But that's just not true. It's not that it comes from the dad. Nowhere in the Bible does it say the sinful nature comes from the dad. So that doesn't really work. Um, and it would also put the women in a spot where they start to resent us guys a lot. So it'd be like every time the kid bites someone, it's like, see, that's because of you, bro. <laughs> that's because my husband gave this kid this sinful nature. He had, you know, that's not what it is. The Bible doesn't say the sinful nature comes to that. Uh, and now, secondly, um, you know, if the Holy Spirit can overshadow and block her sinful nature from passing on to Jesus, uh, he could probably do the same thing by blocking the dads, right? Um, so if you have two human parents, he could also block Joseph's sinful nature and Mary's. Uh, and so I don't think that's necessary. So what's the meaning of the virgin birth? What's the point? 
people who argue that it was just like an incubator for Jesus. And what would Jesus, Jesus wouldn't have looked like Mary. Uh, you know, he would, she could, then she'd pass on her genes and that's weird. And so he's just walking around. It looks like yours got the same nose and ears. And do you look the same as Mary? And what's going on? That's, that's the stuff that keeps Bible college kids awake. It has nothing to do with anything. I don't think that's what's going on in this text at all. The text doesn't care about that stuff. What's the meaning? What's the point? It's not about Jesus looks like Mary and how many genes he got. It's not. I think it's about the uniqueness. Here's the point of all that ranting. The uniqueness of Jesus Christ. That That's what's being shown. He doesn't have a human father. He comes from heaven. So, so that when people are talking about his uniqueness and saying, who is this? Right? Why is he? I don't understand how he's got those powers. It's because he's not natural. He's different. He's something else. 32 times in the Gospel of John, John tells us, or Jesus says, that I came from heaven. That's really strange language. Like, no founder of any religion claims that. Muhammad didn't claim that. Joseph Smith didn't claim that. Jesus goes, I came from heaven. He claims, I'm actually from the heavens. I actually existed already, and then I came. To, it's not that Jesus begins to exist at Christmas, guys. He already exists. That's the theology. And then there's this beautiful point of God is saying to us regarding salvation. And this was the other reason I think he does it this way. I'm the one who had to bring your salvation about because you couldn't. That's the point of the virgin birth. You as humankind tried so hard, but you need a savior so bad. You couldn't do it. So I had to do it for you, to come and save you from yourself. Humankind could not put a savior into society naturally. So I had to come and do it by the Holy Spirit. I had to do some, 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 some beautiful supernatural thing here. I made it happen. I took the initiative. I moved first because you can't save yourself. That's what Christmas is preaching. And some of you sitting here right now, that is the most beautiful freeing news in the world. Because if I just put it on you, then you're just gonna crack under the pressure, all the shame and guilt of religion. So you're doubting and you're wondering, here's the thing, God's going, it's so mysterious, it's so powerful, it's so beautiful. And this is what he does. He takes unlikely scenarios and brings about the transformation of the world, the transformation of you, of your family, of your finances. He cares about all of that. Like this is the, this is the fusion. I, I had to save you, but also look at how much I care. I come into the nitty gritty of life. Right, C.S. Lewis talks about, he, it was like, it'd be like a, a, a God becoming a slug. And some of you are like, yeah, but but I I I don't know. I listen, I don't I don't want to give you my life. I'll you know I like a good story and whatever. But I I don't know if I believe in God anymore. I don't I don't know if I believe in all this fairy tale stuff, this magic stuff. I'm a skeptic. I, I can't really believe this is true. Let me just close about how I experienced the real um, impact of this, the, the, how I experienced the bigness of this God that we're talking about. Why I think this is real. A few years ago. Uh, I was sitting at my desk at work and this overwhelming thought came over me. Uh, it was just in, in, a, in a supernatural moment uh, that I was supposed to go visit the house of a woman in our church. And I was like, I don't know where the thought was brewing from, but I went and asked the secretary. I'm like, hey, I need the address for this woman. Can I get her address? I don't even know her name. And she, I, I knew her name a little bit from a previous interaction, but I didn't know where she lived. I didn't know anything about it. So, uh, I, I went and drove to her house and knocked on the door and nothing, 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 nothing. But I, there was this car in the driveway, so I kind of knew someone was there. And so I uh, waited and waited. And finally, she opens the door and she's standing there and she's uh, in, her, in her pajamas. And she says, what do you want? And I'm like, well, I just came. I just was praying and thinking and came to encourage you and, and talk to you. And can I come in? She's like, yeah, fine. So I come in we sit down and we start to chat. And three hours later, I go to leave. And I prayed with her, and we had a good time. And she goes, do you know why I'm in my pajamas right now at 1 o'clock in the afternoon? I said, no. She said, because I've had this horrific event happen in my life, and I'm so depressed, I'm so down, that I walked down the stairs today, and I said, Lord, today, I'm going to take my own life. And she said, unless, God, you send someone to the front door to encourage me. She said, I fell asleep on that chair over there, and woke up to the sound of you knocking on the door. 
Now, guys, how is that even possible? Never before that or to this day have I ever just gone, I gotta go visit someone in their house. Boom, boom, boom. Hello, I'm Pastor Mark. I'm here to visit. Never, ever. Before then or since then. This is what I'm talking about. That's not just some little, even the, this is, this, this thing, this, it becomes just a story to us, right? Because we've watched kids in these, you know, shepherd outfits going, dee, dee, dee. we play, we, we see it, we, and it all becomes this cute little, no, no, this is serious. This is a massive, mysterious God who is way ahead of us and moves first to save people. Because if he waited for us, it would never happen. And he goes, I'm going to do this. I still do miracles. I still speak. I still move. I still ask people to get up out of their chair and go and do a miracle to save a life. And he's moving right now. And so the question is, do you listen? Do you trust? Do you follow? As the next two weeks, two sermons, we're going to see what these characters or these people in history end up doing when this angel, of course, comes and disrupts everything. But do you? Are you humble enough to go, my gosh, I'm going to have a confrontation with a mysterious God behind the veil who still does things I can't explain? Or do you keep strong and, and hard to yourself? Are you willing to break yourself open, even if you're the big skeptic? He is so powerful and so big, and he moved. He came for you. He died for you. He rose again for you. And now it's our job, like Mary to respond by saying, okay, I'm yours. I will be obedient. I will put my faith in you. That's the challenge for you today. So, Father, I do pray for anyone watching this, anyone part of this service right now, they would feel your spirit convicting their hearts to actually wake up faith to believe in the God who is still moving, still interrupting, still showing up and doing beautiful things in the lives of people who really, at the end of the day, don't deserve it. But you are taking crooked lines in writing amazing stories, and I just pray you do that in the lives of people right now. In Jesus' good name we pray, amen.